Welcome to the May 5th edition of the PFF Forecast. We've got a great show here for you today. Um, new win totals are out after the draft, and uh, we have run uh, our simulation engine. And so we are going to hit the NFC side of the win totals. We're going to pick our favorites, um, any bets that maybe we've made in the past that have changed a little bit. We're going to go over all of those. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's rock. Before we get started, Eric, we do have to tell the good people that um, this weekend, you and I... Not even be, weekend. We're not even selling it short. Yeah, it's We're, not it's, even the weekend. Tomorrow. It's like a... It's half a week, honestly, mm -hmm. that we're going to be in, uh, in the mean streets of Las Vegas. So it's going to be a little... Hopefully we make it back a lot. A pilgrimage. When Kyle Shanahan said, you never know if you're going to make it to Sunday... This he, is one of those situations. He was talking about Austin Gale, yeah. <laughs> this is one of those situations. Talking about Austin Gale. So we're going to record. We're doing the NFC uh, win totals um, that's going to drop tonight, Wednesday night. And then we're going to record the AFC side also today, Wednesday. But it's going to drop for you on Sunday evening. Ethan in the back is going to make sure that uh, that's all good for you. And, um, you know, if, if something happens to us in Vegas... Maybe we'll be recording out there. There'll be a posthumous uh, PFF forecast. Uh, Look, we're uh, going to survive. Works. It's just, you know, you never know. Uh, some things happen. All of us are vaccinated. All of us are, are, are you know, I think there's a re there's a there's something of a reward to not only a great draft season, which I thought, uh, you know, you as our director of content and everything like that. It's not even like my that. title, but yeah. Yeah, well... I'm, that was more like a low, a, a lowercase c direct or lowercase oh, d director of con, you know, like <laughs> you direct content in addition to your actual title, and I, you know, I thought the draft show went, went really well. Um, there were some, there were some, you know, fun times, and I thought that there was a the number of people that messaged me saying, "Look, I can't actually like once they saw your guys' show, I couldn't turn on any of the other broadcast networks anymore." Like I thought that was great, and. Um, you know, it's a testament to you and a testament to the work that, uh, you know, all the people at PFF put in. I think uh, this is probably what? This is probably your first day off since the pandemic started. It might be like my third. Um, yeah. But it's been a it's been a long and sort of stressful road for everybody in the country. But, uh, it, you know, um, and, and, you know, it'll be fun to take some time off. Well, shout out to everyone who tuned in, everyone that uh, listens to this podcast. We appreciate you. We had 17,000 viewers, 18,000 viewers on that Sunday pod, which was more than what we got the post and the post round one pod. Like the, the appetite for draft analysis was just through the roof, which was, was awesome to see. Very not, Very nice. It was super cool to see. Um, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, everyone here at PFF did an awesome job. You in particular being a part of the show all four days, that cannot be understated um so apparently you're ready for vegas that was basically training for what we're gonna do yeah. now it might be slightly more fun you know to play blackjack for eight hours there's two fcs games this weekend that i'm gonna bet on wow right i can't there. believe i didn't know that i'm <laughs> shocked you are you're shocked. i'm absolutely stunned i didn't know that there were two fcs games this weekend um anyways uh so we can actually place these win totals bets Mm -hmm. Here's a question because we talked about this, and I, I talked about this on the PFF Daily Betting podcast with Ben um, Brown. With currency the way it is, like you talk about the bubbles and all that, yeah. do you foresee? Because I do see some value in placing some futures now. For example, I got a Trey Sermon 20, thirty-three to one to win the offensive. Oh, you got him at thirty-three. To yes, one. I found an out that allowed me to do that. Um, I do think you can find some value in the futures market. I also think, weirdly, last year if you placed futures bets, which I did, mm -hmm. a, and you wrote out the uncertainty in the currency market, you probably lost money because right. the currency, you know, I, I got to think that right now 
the current the dollar is only going to get stronger over time uh, because it, it, unless you know and obviously these things can continue to go up but but that's something to consider when you tie your money up for um, what amounts to eight months yeah that's the thing it's like if you have an unlimited bankroll you know you're not worried about this but no one is in that situation if you're betting with credit it, it's not an issue but right. if you're betting you know if you're if you're, in, you're in literally one of taking out your cash to, that's depositing yeah yeah to uh to bet these then it is something i do agree um especially if you like if you've been riding the uh the alternate currency the uh, shit coins wave <laughs> i mean holy shit then um, yeah because there's like two not, not to get too in the weeds here but there's like two branches of it there's like and it depends upon it like some of our friends would say none of these are are uh uh reliable or none of these are legitimate right mm -hmm. but they're probably like let's let's be a little bit down the middle and say like there's like the bitcoin ethereum you know all those coins and then there's the like dogecoin which is like a complete shit coin but it's like if you bought into dogecoin like at two cents and now it's 69 cents or whatever it's like nice. well it's it mean it's meaningful to you yeah you know absolutely and um i guess you're just you know gonna make sure you get out before <laughs> before the, yeah i, before I, the I, like, let's, I have no clue what's gonna happen um which is why um on this wave i've been showing i've been like consistently kind of pulling out a little at a time um it, it, you know to sort of feed both my fomo but also my like um, my uh, risk aversion. It, it's smart. I have only been investing in um, Denver Broncos futures since Aaron oh, Rodgers is, you know. On just, Symbol? On Symbol, on uh, wherever they'll take my money. I forgot that we had a Denver over. Um, yes. And I have a little Denver. I had Denver 13 to 1 to win the West. I remember we talked about that. I bet that as well. Um, so Cleve is on the menu. First day of Las Vegas. That's what we're eating. Yes, I'll have uh, Cleve, medium rare. All right, let's get uh, into the win totals here. Before we do, got to remind you, of course, that um, we have some buddies over at DraftKings, and they are hooking you up for the fight uh, this weekend. Um, it's Canelo Alvarez, and he's fighting some guy. I don't even know his name. I think his name is Billy Bob Joe Saunders or something like that. It um, doesn't really matter. The point is that if you use promo code PFF, at DraftKings Sportsbook, you can bet $1 to win $55 if you just pick the winner of this fight. So I'm guessing Canelo's favored because he's the only guy whose name I know. So go make it happen. Um, get those $55 and then go bet them on, um, you know, either uh, futures of some kind, win totals, whatever it might be uh, from this podcast. Remember, you need to download the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Use promo code PFF to get those 55 to 1 Odds, you must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, Pennsylvania, new customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. All right. Um, let's go ahead and get into it here. Let's start with the NFC West. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read what the current odds are. Um, we can discuss, if you go to pff.com, you will actually be able to see how these have changed over time. There is a, a win total tracker that will track these over the course of time. So the Rams, it has stayed steady at 10 and a half, plus 123 over, minus 150 under. The Niners, exactly the same and has stayed the same. Uh, the Seattle Seahawks, Open at nine and a half, minus one ten to both sides. It's now nine and a half, minus one thirty nine over, mm -hmm. plus one fifteen to the under. And the Arizona Cardinals opened at eight, even money both sides, and now is minus one forty three over, plus one hundred. Over eight was one of our picks previously. Yeah. Interesting with Seattle, you seeing some appetite towards the over. People can't quit them, but their odds to win the division have basically stayed the same at three to hmm. one this entire time. So if you're thinking about trying to ride this wave, um, but you don't want to pay the increased price, you know that's one way to look at the market. Um, you know some things that stay stationary um, while others move. Uh, an interesting uh, sort of thing there. Which one of these, George? So interesting that the san francisco number doesn't move right because because if any you know we we, we supposedly knew what was happening 98 percent of teams mm -hmm. you know 31.36 nfl teams knew what the niners were doing on draft night and yet 
we end up ended up being surprised. But then at the same time, the markets don't move really in any way for them, win total or division odds. So how do you end up using that in this case uh, to profit here? I was trying to think about that because I was surprised, honestly. And here's the reason I was surprised. To me, there's a robustness now to the way that they can win games. So I would have been terrified to bet over 10 and a half with Jimmy G as the quarterback. Like, terrified. Um, and I guess this kind of goes for Mac Jones a little bit, but really not. It's about getting a guy like either Justin Fields or Trey Lance who – if they are good to go, you put them in. It's it's there's going to be this newness to Kyle Shanahan's offense that's going to drive defenses mm-hmm. crazy, right? And so I think there's there are more paths. You talk about sample paths all the time. There are more sample paths to ten and a half, over ten and a half than there were before. Now I say all of that to say I still can't. I still don't think that it makes sense to bet the over. But I'm staying away from the under here. Um, and I'm looking at maybe some alternative markets. I might look to the division odds, um, even though I still think those are a little uh, too short. I might look to conference odds if I were trying to bet the 49ers. Here's one way to bet the 49ers. If you don't want to go under 10 and a half at minus 150, just bet no playoffs at plus 144. Because to me, you're either, yeah. to me, the Niners are a very high end team. Like, I think that the middle for them is a lot hollower than it is for other teams. If Garoppolo stinks and then they put Lance in and Lance plays like a rookie, they're winning six, seven games and they're not making the playoffs. And so you much rather have the plus 144. Like, there aren't that many circumstances when they were win 10 games on the knot or nine games or eight games and, and make the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think that the better way to bet them, if you like them as, if you like them, bet over 10 and a half. I mean, you're getting plus money. It's not a great bet in my opinion, but it, it's, you know, it, it's a good way to, you know, if you don't like them, bet them no to make the playoffs. I, I don't think laying the minus 150 to bet them under 10 and a half is going to be the best way to go about this. I think that makes a ton of sense. Now, let me ask you this. This is a question that I was really fired up to talk about. Just ignoring the win totals for a second. Now they're actually the same for the Rams and the 49ers. Who's the best team in this division? The best team uh, all around. And maybe the better way to ask it is like, who do you think will be the best team? You know, maybe not like right now, but like, let's say we're week 10. It's like, okay, who's the best team in this division and why? I I do think it's the Los Angeles Rams. I, I, but at the same time, I'm not huge on the Los Angeles Rams. It's weird. Like, the Niners, well, so if you play the thing out, and it's weird. If you play the thing out and you get the 90th distribution of every, 90th percentile for every team, I think the Niners are the best team when that ha- all happens. The Seahawks are too limited defensively. Their offensive line isn't good enough, and their coaching certainly doesn't elevate the play around Russell Wilson. Um, if you if you run it all out and you take the median of every team, I think it's Seattle. Weirdly. I agree. But I think that the the tail risk of Seattle being bad exists. And I don't I think that LA has enough pieces to where they avoid catastrophe more often. I don't know if Stafford's good enough to allow them to be great in a in more than just a handful of simulations, but yeah, I guess it's weird, but like LA to me is a team that I think is going to be there, but it's going to be in a very similar way to last year where there's a lot of great things about them, but on the whole, they're uninspiring, but they're still in the mix. I mean, remember when the Stafford golf trade happened, we talked a ton about how people are overestimating the improvement between Stafford and Goff, And I, I still think there's a little of that. I do think their offense will be significantly better, but you have to weigh that they were the number one defense last year. We know even if they kept all the pieces intact, you would go, well, their defense is going to regress because that's what we know about defenses. It's they're so much more volatile from season to season than offenses. And even a drop from first to fifth, like we saw with the Bears, for example, that year after they were so dominant, got so many turnovers, they were a good defense the next year and and it looked completely different 
they were fifth in, in EPA allowed per play, but it was a totally different defense, right? So you expect the same thing to happen with the Rams, but they also don't have Brandon Staley anymore, who is a genius. I mean, a genius defensive schemer. No Troy Hill. No Troy Hill. No John Johnson, mm-hmm. who That's was another one. who was literally. They already don't have great linebackers, and they don't care about linebackers, which I think is sharp. But in a you know, if a team like a team like San Francisco, Shanahan is going is always, to cut them up. Yeah, and that's now, why they've been swept by them four and zero the last two years. John Johnson was the guy that wore the green dot. He was the communicator of that defense. So they're already going to a new coordinator, a new person on the field aligning the defense. They're also, and this is the point that I'm going to make. They have leveraged their draft picks with the players that are veterans that are on the field. The, the, the draft is interesting, and I wanted to make this point at the, the front of it, and I forgot to. Draft Rookie players are rarely going to make a difference for you this year. But they don't have any players from previous seasons who we might expect to make a difference this year. You know, like, yeah. for example, if you're the Niners, you go, okay, well, Brandon Ayuk, they got him last year. He's going to be even better this year. Nick Bosa. You know, like all those players. Yeah. But the Rams don't have those. Those players have been good last year. They were tapped out. Yeah. Yeah. If one of them gets injured, a la Aaron Donald in the playoffs, they're particularly fucked. Yeah. I, I will say the one thing that will help them is if Deshaun Jackson can play like 10 or more games. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but, but like, that, but, showed me that. Yeah, yeah. Please, but that's an, know, if, that's an if. That's uh, an if. A very big if. Tutu Atwell. Probably overdrafted. Probably massively overdrafted. Yeah. Um, he, Tutu Atwell is like 5'9", 145. There's, and was drafted, what, like 20 spots ahead of where DK Metcalf was drafted? There's also Cam Akers playing well down the stretch. Incredible. You wonder if Incredible. they give him the ball too much because he was their first draft pick last year. I mean, they're going to throw... The one thing I'm not worried about is they're going to... If they don't show... If Matt Stafford isn't an MVP candidate, then they've lost, right? yeah. yeah, yeah. So I do believe that's going to be the case. What I think will be interesting is whether, you know, whether Matt Stafford is actually able to take that jump. Because we've seen, look, the big time throws, the highly graded positive throws are there. It's been that there have been a solid, significant number of negative plays with Matt Stafford. We know those are generally consistent. And whether that was a that was just because he was in Detroit and Detroit Sox. Like, yeah, I, I don't know, but I'm going to make the case. Detroit, Detroit though, had some I'm fine. Like the the Jim Caldwell years, like right. he Jim held Caldwell them back. Does not get enough. He like Stafford. They had a really good defense in 14. They, uh, you know, he he's gotten a lot of co- offensive coordinators fired. Let's be honest. Like, uh, you know, and and he's. I'm not saying he's bad. I'm just saying like. You know, he needs to show it almost immediately for this to matter. What were you going to say about the... Well, no, I was just going to say this, that, like, I'm really underwhelmed with what the Seahawks have done. Um, and I thought they've reached, you know, on Eskridge at the top. Um, I still don't think they have... Look, you expect EK Metcalf to improve. We talked about Tyler Lockett not being a sustainable second option or a great second option. Um, I don't have a ton of faith in th- their defense. I think they're solidly the third team. But I think you can make a really legitimate case that the 49ers are are a better team than the Rams. And I'm not saying this as someone that's like a, a 49ers yeah. fan. Like I could I could care less. That's not my I, – I actually would rather they be significantly worse because I want to be surprised in the season. But you just look at the roster top to bottom, and now you look at the quarterback position, you go, okay, if Jimmy G is not healthy, at least they're turning the ball over to a guy who's a freak athlete. If you're mm-hmm. going to have a guy play well as a rookie, he's going to be a freak athlete, okay? Mm-hmm. And Shanahan's going to scheme open players. And if Trey Lance is smart, as everyone claims that he is, well, then he's going to be able to find open players. And if that's the case, watch watch out. You know, like the Niners roster is better than the Rams roster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get a little worried about corner for the Niners. I get a little bit worried about, you know. You know what I think? I think Sherman might be back. Sherman comes back? Well, you would know. You're his, I don't you're know. I actually have no inside information. But I will say this. I do know that he hasn't signed yet. Yeah. So He would make a great Buffalo Bill, but he's not going to want to move to Orchard Park 
Orchard Park. Look, this is one thing I do know. <laughs> this and this is. But nothing. don't you think he would make a great bill? That he make a great bill. A, he's a quintessence. Absolutely. They've and gotten like way better. They went Vontae Davis, then they went Josh Norman, and then they'll go Richard Sherman, a Hall of Fame corner in that sort of twilight part of his career. Uh, well, you can go listen to Brandon Bean talk to Richard Sherman on the on the Chris Collinsworth podcast. They they interviewed yeah. him. And look, I'll tell you this: I know for a fact that Richard Sherman has never been anywhere but the West Coast, and I don't anticipate the late that riser. that's going to stop. Yeah, I don't I don't see that ending anytime soon. Um, let's quickly talk about the Cardinals here because we bet them over eight at minus one ten. Would you still bet them over eight at minus one forty three? No, I. It just it's too expensive. I will say, good on them for letting Patrick Peterson go, the zero war mm-hmm. player last year. Getting Malcolm Butler, who wasn't. Um, Tay Gowan was a very good draft pick for them. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a huge fan of going linebacker, linebacker in rounds one for two straight seasons. Yep. Uh, but they do get Chandler Jones back. They do get J.J. Watt in the fold. Defense should be better. Um, you know, they get uh, Rondale Moore. And an offensive line that I think will get better with Josh Jones, you know, sort of coming into his own in year two. Cliff, it's Cliff. It's all down to Cliff. This is a big thing. And we said this with Tampa Bay before they went on their Super Bowl run. And it was like, look, the talent's all there. If Bruce wants to start calling the the, yep. the good plays, this team's going to have a shot. And I think with Arizona, they're not that far. I mean, like, they, you know, they weren't as good last year as their 8-8 eight eight record. But – they they have talent. Murray is, when healthy, a very good quarterback prospect, and they have they have they're good at good they're good at valuable positions. So they they need to they this is a show me season for Cliff. I would almost rather bet six to one to win the NFC West, and the reason I'd say that is okay. Let's say that they win nine games, ten games, eleven games. What does that mean? Well, I think if they get over, if they get to 9, 10, 10 wins, that that really means that Kyler Murray will have to take a proverbial next step. And the next step for him is being able to throw the ball over the intermediate area of the field. Um, it, it will mean that they're probably going to have to move DeAndre Hopkins around a little bit. Like, move him in the slot one time. I think he lined up in the slot like 10 snaps last Dude, season. It was, it, was, it was bad. It was not great. Um, but Kyler Murray... Uh, and I, I'm pulling this up right now. This is great for audio. Um, Kyler Murray throwing to the 10 to 19 range downfield had just a 72 passer rating, which was about 15, 20 points below um, league average. 130 passer rating, throwing 20 plus yards downfield. Like the big bugaboo for him there. And that's where most really good quarterbacks kill it. So I see if you know if they win that many games, I think they have a chance to be really good, um, and that's why I, if I were to bet them, I'd go six to one to win the division. Let's go to the NFC South. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have been eleven and a half the whole time. It's now moved out to minus one twenty five over, plus one hundred three under. New Orleans Saints uh, has stayed nine minus one ten to both sides. The Panthers has stayed at seven and a half, but it's now moved to plus one eighteen to bet the over, minus one forty three to bet the under. And our Atlanta Falcons, this has moved from seven minus one forty three to the over to seven and a half. After, of course, we bet it. Um, look, we you know we've been moving the line on the Falcons for far too long. I didn't expect it to stop now. Uh, and minus one ten to both sides. Um, so I guess we'll start with the Falcons. Would you still bet over seven and a half minus one ten? Yeah. Uh, look, um, the Saints are eventually going to be a disaster. Like they've drafted fifteen players the last three years. Two of them are quarterbacks, Tommy Stevens, and I use it. I use it lightly, but Ian Book, um, and like they they have no secondary. T- I mean, is if Jameis starts, Michael Thomas is going to set the targets record. Like, he's just going to pump targets to him. I don't see them being very good offensively. I don't see them very being very good defensively. I think Carolina, similarly, you know, Darnold isn't it. Um, they might get some good play out of Darnold, but they got some good play out of Bridgewater last year. And it didn't matter because they're just not a, a complete team. Um, you know, obviously, I hold out some hope for Matt Rule, um, but 
you know, it's it's going to be a lot. And then you look at, you know, Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay had sort of everything go right. They faced Atlanta in the second half of the year last year. Atlanta had them 17 nothing at halftime, 24-7 at one point, lost to them at home, and then had a lead against them, I believe, in week 16 or 17, and lost that as well. Like, Atlanta can compete with anybody in this division. And let's say they go 4-2 and two against their division rivals. Like, then you're only needing four wins on the rest of the schedule and you know they're a fourth place team they get that kind of schedule i think it'll be good for them um you know uh i i believe that arthur smith will, will coach offense it'll be good enough to win eight games or more i still think this is maybe the best win total to bet right now so if you didn't bet it before and you're listening to this now you know for the first time i still really like it now you look at we talk about draft classes not mattering as much but Let's say this, Kyle Pitts, look, he's a tight end. I get that he's a tight end. If you go look at most tight ends that have been drafted and then go look at Kyle Pitts and I asked you if they were the same position, you'd probably struggle to tell me, yes, they were the same position. So if you're going to pick a guy who's going to help out an offense, it's gonna be Kyle Pitts. And I, I love the narrative of, oh, their defense is just so bad. Yeah, their defense is bad, but it also has been saddled with not the greatest defensive you know scheme for the players that they have they don't have dan quinn anymore they have a fresh face there and their offense has interestingly also been saddled with dan quinn right because he's been the ultimate decision maker there but clearly that's not the best place for him all by all accounts a fantastic human being by the way it's not a dan quinn shit on session so i think the positive regression for both sides of the ball is massive i mean it's massive and you mentioned the Saints. I think the Saints stink. The Saints are a sneaky team. I'll say this. You're talking about who's a sneaky team to have a top five pick next year? It's the New Orleans Saints. It's the New Orleans Saints. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, do you know the la do you want to name the last quarterback that was drafted by the Saints to win up a game for them? It's a really good one. Oh my God. Saints haven't drafted a quarterback in the first round since Archie Manning. Holy shit. But they, but they did draft somebody who started for them and won. I have no idea. Danny Werfel. Oh, my God. Like, we're talking about, like, wow. a, yeah. a franchise that has been uniquely, has been has caught unique. Like, we, we think about them as, like, being unlucky. But in reality, they've had some pretty good runs over here. And I think, you know, the luck is probably going to run out for this year for the Saints. Yes. So, uh, this is similar to... Uh, what was the example last year? Um, oh, we wanted to bet against the Eagles, right? And so we bet on the football team. This is a similar one to me where I'm not, I don't necessarily want to bet, you know, the Saints specifically, mm -hmm. but I'm going but to bet But nine the is an egregious number. So bet under Saints. I, you know, the, the number actually is really good here if you want to bet under for them. Yeah. Um, we go, we go in art smock. Yeah, let's talk Panthers here. What's your what's your take on them? My take is that they will be productive offensively. You can't not, right? With more uh Robbie Anderson, Terrace Marshall, uh Christian McCaffrey, a, you know, an offensive line that I believe gets some help. But you know, Darnold is probably going to average like 7.5 yards per attempt. He's going to put up decent numbers, and it's going to get Joe Brady a job, and it's going to hurt the long-term straights of the franchise because, you know, they're going to keep Darnold around for year five. He's going to be on another offensive coordinator. It's going to be a long-term bad thing. Does that mean they can't win games this year? No. Actually, I think that they have a decent shot of winning some games this year. Um, I, I don't think I could advise under on them. But I do think they, you know, I don't think they keep the, the you know, at seven and a half. I wouldn't bet under seven and a half at minus 130. But I do think they, they don't keep the Falcons from achieving their goals. Yes. I, I feel similarly. I think if I had to bet one side or the other, um, oh, man, this is tough. I think I ultimately would bet, um, I would bet over. And the reason I would do that is, again, fading the Saints. It, and if you get an Atlanta implosion, you get some, you get some yeah. of your money back. Like, I think my two favorite bets in this division would be both overs for the teams that are lined at 7.5, betting against the Saints. And the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 
again, are another candidate for some defensive regression. Um, they were, you know, by and large, pretty damn healthy the entirety of the season. Um, yeah, I'm not going to advocate betting against Tom Brady there, but I, I would bet um, over both of those two. Um, let, let's talk briefly about the the Bucks. Um, if you had to bet one side of this, um, what would you go with? Uh, probably under, just because it's really hard to win that many games. And, and uh, frankly, they didn't win that many games the year they won the Super Bowl. So, you know, that. Um, but they're clearly the best. I mean, you saw their odds go up from 750 to 650 to win the Super Bowl. I think as a result of the Packers falling in mm -hmm. many's eyes with the Rodgers news. Um, but they are clearly the class of the NFC right now. They are the closest thing to an elite team that the NFC has. Um, but those are, you know, betting over on those teams is suck are, is a sucker bet. So um, probably just lay off them, enjoy them. If you bet over, you know, don't be surprised if you get disappointed. It's a team with an old quarterback, you know, and, and Ooh, you never see that coming. Careful. I, was, I was talking to Timo, our careful. colleague, a Bucks fan. Um, he has a, a fun Scotty Miller jersey in his, in his office. Um, we were talking and we said, like, you know, what would it take for Brady to retire? And I said, well, it's probably going to take an injury and more interceptions and touchdowns. Like when Favre retired, it was 10, 11 touchdowns, 19 picks, two concussions, he's gone. When Manning retired, it was like s s nine touchdowns, 17 picks, and an injury to his, you know, an injury that, you know, but we have never, we haven't seen Brady get injured in over a decade. We've never seen him throw a lot of interceptions. So like, we're not even seeing like the beginning of the end for him, I don't think. But that to me, the if if he were to fall off a cliff, right, that would be the, the that would be curtains for Tampa Bay. We move now to the NFC North. The Green Bay Packers, ten and a half. It has been that way. It is still ten and a half, minus one forty three over plus one eighteen to the under. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings, eight and a half. It's now minus one fifty five under uh, over. Yeah. Plus 127 under. Uh, that has moved out considerably. It opened plus, 20, plus 123 over, minus 150 under. So that is completely flipped in terms of price. The Chicago Bears opened at 7, minus 121 over. It's now 7.5, minus 150 to the over, plus 123 to the under. And the Detroit Lions are still at 5. It's plus 100 to bet the over, minus 121 to bet the under. The Packers number, I believe, got taken down after we did this. Uh, you know, we did the the win total update. Oh, it's still not. It's not up. Yeah. Can't get anymore. Okay. Well, I, I was going to say that was suspicious to me. Um, so let's let's start with the Bears then. Do you think a move? This is a move of almost an entire win. Do you think that's warranted? Yeah, they weren't. The seven was a a, and a very bad number to begin with. You know, I think. You look at their team, like they lost Kyle Fuller. They lost, you know, they have they have atrophied a little bit, but you still have a key mix. You have Khalil Mack, who's a very good football player. You have Jalen Johnson, who's a great draft pick. Um, that team has... Wilcon Swift, Eddie Jackson. Yeah, that team has a shot to be good on defense. And they have been. They're eight games over 500 the last three years. They're not a, bu a team full of bums. Mm -hmm. And then on offense, you have Allen Robinson. You have an offensive line where I believe they got Tevin Jenkins in this draft. You also have Second you know uh, Mooney. You also have uh, Tree Cohen coming back. You have uh, Anthony Miller, Anthony Miller. Um, and you add a better, a bigger floor, a higher floor to the quarterback position because Dalton is probably going to play until the wheels come off. And once the wheels come off, then it's Justin Fields who is the second or third best quarterback uh, prospect in the draft. You know, the last time you know when Kansas City had Mahomes behind. Smith, it was Matt Nagy's office coordinator there. And I do think Matt Nagy is underrated relative to Ryan Pace. Like, I think this move doesn't mean Pace somehow figured it out. It's just a good decision among many decisions he's had. But I do think what it can do is unlock Ryan, uh, Matt Nagy to be to be seen as being better than what he, you know people you know have said he has been over the past few years. I agree. A thousand percent. I know we don't want to sit on sit here and agree, but I would bet them three twenty five to win the division, um, plus one plus three twenty five to win the division. Yeah. The reason I would do that is okay. You look at the Vikings and the Lions. The Bears were better than those teams, arguably, even with Dalton. You know, and I know Vikings fans are going to be mad about that, but like 
look, the Bears are a really good roster, and the problem was that they didn't have a quarterback. Andy Dalton, we talked about this, was a big step up from Mitch Trubisky. Yeah. Like that, it, Andy Dalton Especially be, adjusted for price, like at the veteran exactly. QB level. Yep. Um, and then you look at the Packers, and you go, okay, well, what are the chances that Rodgers isn't there anymore? And if you believe those are anywhere close to 50%, then you got to be looking to bet who yeah. the next best team is. And for my money, that's the Chicago Bears. Look, there's something to the cultural aspect of the team. They have a lot of really good players who came to work every day and said, fuck, why am I here? Yeah. And now, so, so here's the thing I would be looking for. I would be looking for every report I can get on how Justin Fields is working at the facility with teammates. And I know that's like, you know, voodoo culture stuff, but I think that's a huge thing because if he comes in, he has the talent that Mitchell Trubisky did not to where if he comes in and he's working his ass off, I mean, yeah, it's, it's going to be, you know, if Dalton plays a couple games, sure, but it's going to be a huge win for that. Minnesota team. has also the potential. Let's move on to Minnesota for a second. Yeah. So the Vikings have... The Vikings have the talent on offense to be pretty good. And especially when you look, Bradbury's a first-round pick. Darisaw's a first-round pick. O'Neal, uh, Wyatt Davis, second-round you know, second pick, picks, third-round picks. Like, they finally have an offensive line for Cousins. They have Jefferson coming back rookie of the year. Well, should have been rookie of the year. You have Thielen, Irv Smith. That can be a good offense. The defense still stinks. Like, Patrick Peterson... You know, my, my colleague, uh, or my friend, sorry, Matthew Collar was talking to me about Patrick Peterson went to the Vikings for $10 million. Casey Hayward just went to the Raiders for $4 million. Like, the yeah. Vikings have been mismanaging the defense for a long time. They get Dalvin Tomlinson to go with Michael Pierce. Both are nose tackles. They're going to try to play Dalvin Tomlinson at the three. He's, like, the splits for him at three technique and nose are bad. Like, they're not going to be good defensively. They might be better than they were last year. Does a weaker division at you know for Green Bay specifically in Detroit does that help the Vikings? I think, but they swept the Detroit. They won two, one of yeah. two with Green Bay. So there, you know, I can see why the Vikings win total is eight and a half. I can see why people like over, but the bottom's going to fall out of that team at some point if it hasn't already. Especially with the Cousins thing, we don't know how Cousins will deal with having to compete mm -hmm. with Kellen Mond at this point. So I think. The Bears are a much better bet adjusted for price than the Vikings are, and um, you know I'm I'm somebody who's holding a four plus four hundred Vikings to win the North at plus two forty, plus two twenty, whatever it is now, plus two seventy, depending on where you look. It's not a good bet. It, Chicago's the bet to make in the NFC North adjusted I for price. I agree. I would not bet. I would not bet the Vikings under eight and a half, um, but I'm certainly not betting the over. I'm not betting them to win the division. Yeah. For those exact same reasons. Here's a question for you. Like the Kellen Mond pick, it feels like one of those picks that was, let's take a quarterback who doesn't feel like a real threat, but secretly yeah. we're hoping that he's good. Is that, is that the same vibe you got? He's also like the anti-Kirk. So Mond threw two passes away this year, this past year. He was sacked eight times. Those numbers have gotten progressively better for him. He actually, in the pocket, does a very good job of like, of doing, like his pocket awareness is very good. You know what he's not? His, he's not all that great at throwing the ball. Like he's 14 of 57 outside the hash marks, mm -hmm. over 10 yards downfield. Like the one, like Kirk is terrible awareness in the pocket, not athletic at all, not a very good leader, but he can throw the hell out of the ball. Like the thing is, is if you set Kirk's feet for him and, and tell him where to go with the ball and the guy's open, Kirk's going to throw lasers all day. So it's, it's almost the exact opposite of what the, and, and so it's weird that they drafted a QB to do all the things that Kirk does poorly well, but that I don't know if he can do the things Kirk does well, well. Or, or just decent. Yeah, exactly. Because, because think, and I was talking to this with uh, with some guys in the in the Minnesota market. It's like the bar's pretty low because Kirk's only like a two win quarterback, two and a half WAR in his best day. He's making thirty five times as much as Mond is making, right? So Mond, what does Mond have to be for the for it to make sense? A one one and a half WAR quarterback? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and do the Vikings hit the? So let let's say okay, let's let's roll this thing back. Let's assume the Vikings start 1-5 like they did last year. Man. 
they're going to Mod in week seven, aren't they? Because last season they had no, like they weren't going to go to Sean. They weren't they weren't going to subject the world to Sean Mannion for I mean, ten weeks. But like, remember, remember when um, I wanted them to get Jameis? No, no, no. I was going to say, remember when Eric Dickerson said Sean Mannion was the best option for the Rams? <laughs> that was. I think I'm getting that right. I might not be. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The 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 other thing there is we just talked about like the culture aspect. Kirk Cousins does not have that for this team. And if Mon does, it makes it even harder if they get off to a bad start. Um, Colin Mon, by the way, four ye- so he played four years at Texas A&M, was never injured once. Kirk Cousins, in his time in Minnesota, has never missed a snap due to injury. Like both of these guys, extremely durable in you know to yeah. the degree that that is repeatable, which is interesting for the Vikings. I I will say this though, I I, I mean I, I really liked. Uh, ignoring the fact that they didn't take Justin yeah. Fields. And it's hard to ignore, but remember, it's also awesome to see every GM going, you know what, we actually were going to take Justin Fields if he got to us, but he didn't. You know, it's like, yeah. no, no, if you were going to take Justin Fields, you would have traded up to get him. That's the story. But taking Christian Dereshaw at 23, you know, having a better offensive line if Dereshaw can come in and do anything close to like what a Tristan Wirfs did. Um, that could really help them. They also have all these draft picks from the prior season that hopefully come in and start to make some. The one sort thing of that the Vikings were stupid with, though, is they they they've never spent above a third rounder on an edge player, and we know that like that is a tried and true way of getting a pass rush. Mm-hmm. If Danell Hunter doesn't come back well from the neck injury, yep. or doesn't run a ret- like, there are rumors that he's not even happy there, right. and he might you know want to trade. Like they're they're in deep trouble on the defensive side of the ball you know, as a result of always thinking that Zimmer can coach these defenders up, when the bottom falls out of a, of a hypothesis like that, it's, it's, it's messy in a hurry. It, look, let's talk about Detroit for just a brief second, because I, okay. I will say this. Under five's tough. Under five is real tough. But that being said, we have put, we've started to put a tank variable in our model, and we are applying it to Detroit. And, the, and, and I say that for a very specific reason. When you are betting on a team that is not trying to lose, I'm not going to say that. There's a difference, in, in my opinion, between trying to lose and not trying to win. Mm-hmm. When you start Mike Glennon for six weeks at a time right. in place of friend of the PFF forecast, Gardner Minshew, you are not trying to win. You might not be like throwing games, but you're not trying to win. Mm-hmm. And if you if you had an overseason win total on the Jags, which I did, it's extremely frustrating. So know this. I it's a there's a very good chance Detroit they might not be trying to lose. And I and I actually think they're very like they got some sharp people that work there. I think they're building it well from I think the, they had a really nice draft. Yeah, I think they're building it well from the bottom up. But they are they might do things from a personnel standpoint in season that's of the let's get the best draft pick next year ilk and for that reason you can't bet them 20 to 1 to win the division no. you can't bet them over 5 you can't do any of that thing any of that yeah shit. let me just uh look Brad Holmes had a nice draft if he next year gets to pick a quarterback in the top 5 he's not going to be sad his yeah. job's still going to be there so if you think they drafted Panay Sewell to protect Jared Goff's ass for the next 10 years you're high. Yep. All right. To the NFC East we go. The Dallas Cowboys. I think we're going to have some disagreement on the NFC East. I'm excited. Dallas Cowboys, nine and a half. It is still plus 110 over, minus 134 under. Washington football team has gone from eight, minus 110 both sides, to eight, minus 139 over, plus 115 under. New York football giants opened seven, minus 110, and is now seven, minus 125, plus 103. And your Philadelphia Eagles, six and a half, uh, minus 150 to the over is where it opened. It's now six and a half, minus 134 over, plus 110 under. Where do you think we'll disagree most? Let, let's start with the Philadelphia Eagles because I think we're in alignment here. Everything we just said about Detroit, I think you could say about the Eagles. Under six and a half is probably more of a bet. I would bet yeah. it, actually. I, you would. I, I think... And, and actually, Timo and I were talking about this today, which I thought was would be an interesting discussion. The Eagles are not... The Eagles do some really sharp analytical things mm-hmm. where I think that they fail. And so we were I was sort of thinking about this. So Kansas City 
is not an analytical they're they're not the most analytical team in the world no nope. but they're one of the more functional teams in the world and hence you you never see the bottom fall off the the Cleveland Browns with the Sash, in, in the Sashi era were analytically sound but not functional, functional. and hence and hence yep. you saw the issues Cleveland Baltimore are, are now appear both to be analytical and functional and hence why you've seen the fruits of the labor come out I think Philadelphia with all the news coming out I still consider them analytical. I consider them very dysfunctional currently. So I think this season is a big one for Philadelphia to get their processes back in place, for them to figure out what they want to be and sort of like moving forward. As such, I don't see wins on their I don't see wins on their ledger. I yeah. just don't. I'm not betting this one. I do, as you know, I'm a believer in the Jalen Hurts bandwagon. I love the Devonta Smith pick. Mm -hmm. Love it. Very good one. I think that was one of the better picks in the entirety of the draft. Um, and I think it has the potential to really help Jalen Hurts. Really help him. Because Jalen Rager was not your number one guy. Maybe mm -hmm. Jalen Rager is an awesome number two. But now you at least get to find out. Um, but I agree with you. The dysfunction, the defense is going to be bad. Um, and, like, I, man, do you have any faith in Nick Sirianni? No, and... Back to that point, like Tampa Bay, a classic example. Not the most analytically franchise, analytical franchise in the world, but supremely functional. Supremely functional, right? It, it, the yeah, it's a good the point. time it'll take Philadelphia to figure the thing out is going to be longer than one year. And I, you know, I'm I'm allowing the coach to sort of work as like Dungy was always. Dungy was very a very good coach, but not a coach that we would have said in his first press conference, oh my God, he, he commands a room, he's mm -hmm. a stud, et cetera, et cetera. The, I'll give Sirianni a shot here. I don't think that their record this year is going to, it's going to be how they look. And, and, but, but as such, like I, I, I think one of the mistakes we've made sometimes in the past is betting on teams that, not, I'm not saying again, that are trying to lose, but are not trying to win. Yeah. And, and, and I think the Eagles might fall in that category. And as such, I'm laying off of this. Which brings me to where we're going to disagree, I think, the most, which is Dallas. I think that Dallas at plus 125 to win the division. And when you look at their win total, let me, let me find the, the current number, over 9.5 plus 110. I think those are two very, very enticing numbers for me. It, it's, mm. it's my wheelhouse. Mm. Defense doesn't matter. Defense does matter, but not that much. Defense doesn't matter. Weapons matter. Good play calling matters, which is, I think, Kellen Moore gives you. And quarterback play at the very top end is, is what you come here for. And the fact of the matter is, if Dak plays the way he played the first five, six games last year, mm -hmm. if you get that for a whole 17-game season, yeah. nine and a half is a joke. I'm sorry. like, And I understand everything that can befall Dallas – and we bet they're under numerous times before. But you get McCarthy in year two. McCarthy in year one with Green Bay was eight and eight. Not a very impressive team. Year two, they were 13 and three. And in the NFC title game, he shows some pragmatism, signs his guy, Mike Nolan, gets rid of his guy, Mike Nolan. In, in And who do they have, by the way? Who Jerry they replace him? Rid of Mike Nolan. Yeah, but they replaced him with Dan Quinn, a guy who's been a head coach in the league. Mike Nolan was too, but Dan Quinn actually is a successful head coach for a time. I think McCarthy, they're, they're, McCarthy has a lot of great traits. Not all of them are great, but he has some great traits. And the defense was horrendous last year, but there is some... You could make the case that Demarcus Lawrence will come back and be better. You can make the case that the linebackers will be better now that they literally have 17 of them. And pe folks like Trayvon Diggs will, will carry their weight better this year. And the division is still bad. The two teams we're going to talk about after this, we are making a lot of speculative and faithful inferences on their behalf. So I said last year that I would not go over on the Dallas Cowboys because I thought the first year was not the year. Now that we are on to the year, the second year, I'm definitely closer. Here's my, t here's the tough thing with the Cowboys. I don't think they're demonstrably better than the football team. I just don't. 
And part of the reason that I don't think they are is, look, I think their offense is going to be really good. I think the football team's offense can be really good too. The tough thing for Dallas is that they, every time they win a game, they have to win like 1.3 games. And what I mean by that is that they're the Dallas Cowboys. Everyone watches those games. They're all in prime time. They get the emotional, the stress level for the Cowboys going through a week is different than for other teams. Mm -hmm. And you see it play out. Like they, Jerry Jones has this aura about him. The football team doesn't have that. Yeah, they have a, an owner that isn't the greatest in the world, but you don't hear about him at every press conference. You know, Jerry Jones is doing a press conference. Um, Saying Dan Snyder is, is is not the greatest thing in the world is like <laughs> he's not. It's like saying is that, chicken tikka masala is kind of kind of fattening. <laughs> that was an interesting move there. Yeah. Look, uh, the ice cream that I gorge on is only kind of bad for me. Yeah. <laughs> if I had to bet one side of this, I do think that I would bet. Over. Okay, I got and you. you. Can I got see you. how much of a struggle that is yeah, for me. Yeah, no. It, it I just, would much rather. I would much rather bet the Washington Football Team to win the division. I did bet them at three to one. I would bet they're over at eight. Um, everyone is hating on Fitzpatrick. I don't know why. Well, here's what I'll say about the Fitzpatrick hate because I'm one of them that has been like, hey, let's pound the brakes. He has not played a full 16 game season well in forever. But I will say this Heineke being in place ha increases the offense's floor. Like, I, they have two I don't, quarterbacks. Yeah. My point is, I don't need Fitzpatrick to play the whole 16 yeah. or 17. Eights. So they finish eight nine. I think Rivera is a far more un, is a very underrated coach. Agreed. I'm not fading Washington with my Dallas pick. I'm more saying that, like, do the experiment in in Washington's best world. They can't touch Dallas's best world. That's where I disagree. If with Dallas you. scores That's thirty five points a game, I would disagree with you there. I think that Washington's offensive ceiling is really high. Terry McLaurin, okay, I know people are going to get angry about this. If I am drafting wide receivers in the NFC East, my first choice is Terry McLaurin. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very defensible take. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I don't think Cooper, I, I don't think Amari Cooper's Cooper. earned that yet, or you earn that anymore. Um, Gallup certainly hasn't. I think Lamb could be in that, in that situation. I mean, number two um, is big, Kenny Galladay. I'm a big Kenny Galladay fan. Yeah, I, the the defense is also a lot better, but we're going to see some probably some regression, even sure. though they've done a good job there. But like Dallas's offense is Dallas's offense can touch best of league. Okay. Whereas Washington's will, let can, me push back on that for a second because you know what Dallas is going to do? They're going to run fat Zeke into the line. And you know what Dal Dallas's strength used to be? Used to be their offense. Do we line. have an update, by the way, it's on not there Zeke? Anymore. What uh, what update? What do you want to? Am I supposed to be tracking his Weight Watchers journey? I'm wondering his weight loss journey. Would be like if, if Zeke Has he came in as, yet? If Zeke was a Safelt uh, two ten, uh, let me Zeke. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I am still. I, I agree. I am on. I'm not negative on Washington. Team. I'm just. I'm just very. I'm just very. You're negative. I, you're I'm negative happy. on Washington. I, I think Dallas could be a lot better than they I showed last season. You're you're a Cowboys fan. What a lame ass you are. Look at me. I'm look. I'm not contrarian, <laughs> willing yeah. to go with the Washington football team. I, um, I mean, look at the NFC East right now. Uh, where are these odds? Um, the Cowboys plus one twenty five. Washington football team plus two sixty. Here's a bet that I also like. I, I already bet the football team three to one. I would still bet them plus two sixty. I'm not betting it again. But a bet that I am making is the New York Giants at four to one. I had a, there's an out right now that has them at plus four fifty. I did take that yesterday. They strike me as the as very similar to a 2017 Jacksonville team. Ooh. Here's why. So you got quarterback yeah. coming. You know how to get me excited. Quarterback you put going Blake into his, Bortles out there. We have quarterback going into his third year. Did you compare Daniel Jones to Blake Bortles? Is that what you're doing? Kind of. Bortles had a 35 Maybe. touchdown season in his second year. I guess Bortles was in year four when he when he did that. But anyway, and then you have you have a top five running back, 
bar, you know, drafted. Mm -hmm. You have a defense with a lot of talent that hasn't put it together really yet. And a division that could be weak. If, if a lot of things go, you know, I, I can see it happening. I think if four, the, I mean, the, the fact that they have similar odds or same odds as the Eagles is egregious. It's egregious. So, so go ahead and get yourself some New York. Uh, obviously, there's tons of things that can hold them back. You know, Jason Garrett could hold them back. Daniel Jones could hold them back. But if Daniel Jones gets some like turnover luck, like Bortles did in in that year, like they could do it. And and, and I and it wouldn't surprise me one bit. Daniel Jones, um, his PFF grade last year, middle of the pack. Um, if he has that kind of production from a grading perspective then I think they then I, I think they'll go over their win total here um, of seven uh, if you look we have the New York football Giants going over that win total 62 percent of the time um, need about 56 percent to break even so you know I, I would go over there uh, at minus 125 I thought Kadarius, I think the Kadarius Tony pick is really interesting and one that if the scheme actually leverages him, like could help. But I think Kenny Galladay is a massive, massive addition. Mm -hmm. That wide receiving core, we just talked about the Cowboys receiving core. This wide receiving core is good. You mm -hmm. know, Darius Slayton, Kenny Galladay, Evan Ingram, if he catches Evan the Ingram, ball, if he catches the ball, um, Sterling Shepard, like. Could be good. So plus Saquon go, Barkley, man, out of the backfield, you know, doing the thing. Full arrow route. Um, all right, that is the NFC win totals. We will be back with you on Sunday evening with the AFC side. We thank you guys for watching. We love you all. We'll talk to you later. Peace out.